Right, so and all, everyone, welcome back to Fearless in Devotion, the Wrexham AFC podcast, which is sponsored by the Fat Boar Bar and Restaurants. Um, restaurant? Restaurants. There's only one Fat Boar, but there's more in the chain. Is that right, Tim? No, there's more than one Fat Boar. There's one in Mole, isn't there? Uh, uh, yes, there is. There is. Uh, there go. He's got a portfolio. He's reaching his He's reaching his magic number, I think, of portfolios pre retires in a blaze of glory old sells rich, it so. to some American Good old rich love rich love rich go and fill out my eyes Gwyn, everywhere else in the, in the last few games of the season and beyond well, there we go um we're going to talk about the away win at Doncaster in this podcast no sorry at Colchester um and the loss at Doncaster which feels like a long time ago now um as well as uh, a bit more chat on Wrexham's uh, finances following the um Publishing of the accounts last week. But first, let's talk about that Colchester win. Tim, I mean, we needed that, didn't we? It's made a hell of a difference going into these two home games. Yeah, massive. It felt massive, to be honest. I, I kind of tried to play it down before and I felt quite relaxed about it. But the closer you got to kick off, the more you felt you looked at the table and you looked at the other, other, other matches on that were on that day. And it just felt, if we're, if we're ever going to really take this kind of promotion race, you know, ball by the horns and today has to be it really, you know, penultimate away game. Tough as well, Colchester changing manager. They've, they've become a lot harder to beat. So it's a proper, proper banana skin to be honest. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't pretty, but who cares really about pretty if you can be effective, even if it's only for 35, 40 minutes. So massive, massive win. Yeah, it sounded. It felt quite typical, didn't it, Andy? In that it wasn't really a brilliant performance, you would say. Um, and if anything, we could have been more than one goal down. Um, but you know, came back and got three points somehow. I think it's one of those where everything seems set up for a Colchester victory. Um, new manager bounce. Um, they, the, it was a really windy day. Long trip after another long trip. Uh, they, they, they'd even had to change the dimensions of the pitch to make it more compact. And you just looked at all that and thought, right, big man up front for them. Biggest home crowd of the season. You could see Wrexham losing it. Uh, the fact that they didn't, they they weren't great until until Colchester scored. But fair play to them, they kicked into life. Um, Colchester had a game plan that involved them hitting a Kinde and a Kinde was he's a big experienced striker fair play um I, I you always thought by the he was going to tire after 60 minutes they took him off they were never really the same again um but I think Colchester put a lot into it into the first half to make us look ordinary and I think they ran out of steam a little bit in the second half which allowed us to uh to sort of put put the foot on the throat and it was just a classic away day everything you really wanted from the away day you got there yesterday even going behind having Everyone being a bit down and then snatching a snatching a win. I mean, it's it's yeah. just brilliant. I, I I one of my favorite away days of the season. Probably doesn't get as close to to Notts County just because of the history that we have with that club, but it's pretty close. Should um, should they have had a penalty in the first half? Do you think? Uh, no, Mendy. I no, I, th- I think I think because I mean I've not watched it back to be perfectly honest, but. Mm. I mean, we, we couldn't see from where we were. We were obviously in the first half, but it's one of those because of the nature of the tackle, you always run the risk because it's not like a sliding tackle or something like that. Because it's like foot to foot, you always run the risk of it. I think so. It, it gives a, the referee a bit more of a difficult decision to make. So I don't think it was, but yeah, um, probably one of the, the few things that Mendy managed to do before he was he was uh, injured yeah. and. Yeah. Yeah, oh, look. Well, hamstrings yeah. are horrible injuries. We'll come on to that later. Let's let's talk about Max first because you know we've spoken about him plenty of him in the last few weeks. But I, I I don't know. I'm lost for words really because how great that he got the winner and he he's just turned it into an absolutely vital part of that team. That back line, he's class, isn't he? <laughs> I you know what I I think he struggled a little bit yesterday just because it was quite a a, a tight game. Uh, defensively, he was up against a really experienced uh, old campaigner, and, and as ever, they put they put the big man on Max. But Max, a couple of seasons ago, may have struggled. He didn't as much yesterday, just because he's bulked up and he's full of confidence. But I tell you what, I've seen that goal back loads of times, probably on loop on the train home, and it's a great finish. It goes, it travels so far. It goes, it goes right into the corner. He doesn't know what to do. He literally doesn't know what to do um, when he. <clears throat> 
when he scores. He it's has he scored a league game, Tim? You you probably know more he's than me. Ever, he's it's his first, trophy. It's his first first ever league goal. He scored uh, in the FA Trophy a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. Oh it yeah, it was a screamer, wasn't it? Yeah, he it was, was a screamer. He won five or six. It was it against Worcester? I want oh, to say something it was like that. that. Yeah, Gloucester, Gloucester, yeah, it's so yeah, because yeah. I think they played him in midfield in that game, and we we're like, oh, we could convert him into a midfielder here. Um, but yeah, I what Andy said about just going the goal first. If you look at the goal back, his marker is pulling out his shirt initially, so he shows the initial initial strength to shrug that off, and he just steps in front of him, just takes the step because he knows where he, where he's going to put his head on it. Takes the step, just glances the header in, and. The, Keeper's beaten. The bounce of the ball beats the keeper. Um, I put out a Max Kluwerth appreciation post yesterday. I'll just read a couple of comments. Gary, you already know what I think. Kluwerth will one day captain us in the Champions League. Uh, Max is a very special talent, says Craig Jones, composed and ruffled by big physical men, defends so well, the face of an angel, the heart of a lion. I can go on and on and on and on and on and on about this. Um, personally, for me, I think he's the player of the season. Some people are saying, well, I'm not so sure. But I, 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 it depends on how you verse it. Some people are saying that a player of the season should be over the course of a season, etc. For me, it's about if he, he's when he's been in, he was initially out of the side, and then when he's come in at a crucial part of the season, he's just been solid. I know there's a couple of little tiny errors yesterday, but they went that noticeable and they weren't that costly not as costly as McLean's that was a bit of an error to, which led to the goal so I just think for what he gives when you watch him when when he clears the ball he looks to clear it into a position that Mullin might be able to race onto he doesn't hack it out he invariably hacks it out he just looks to drive it and put it beyond the halfway line in the hope that we can pick up the second balls he's always doing it and I just think for what he gives us he's 21 He's, he's just a, an air of consistency, calm. I love the fact that amongst all the, the superstar, well-known players in the team, he's just getting on with his business calmly, quietly. And I just think he he's he's, he's in with a very big shout, you know, of getting it. And there I think as well... Yeah. Sorry, Sorry there was a lovely bit at the end where... Um, yeah. The players were sort of, you, you know how they do. Your know, Mullin likes to come and do the sort of the fist pump at the end. And a lot of the players, George Evans was the first one over to 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 clap the clap the away fans. Uh, and and Max sort of sort of wandered over, but was doing a bit of applause until until the senior pros. Was it McLean? Dragged yeah, they should have pushed him, him to the him. front yeah. and said, "Right, you you away support, you give this guy." The, the the applause he he um he he deserves and we did we responded to that it was it was a really nice moment because he looked like he looked really awkward he didn't really want to do it but mm. um but but that, 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 that that's what makes it even more special part, isn't it, isn't it? Yeah. He's, he's just yeah. so nonplussed he's just somebody who's playing for the love of the game as are the others but like if you you watch his interview after and he's just like yeah it was dead nice it's been a long time coming um and I, I'm hoping there's many more of those moments in front of those fans. He's just so down to earth, and he's just like literally the boy next door. And he's just there's just you'd never guess he was a footballer if you saw him in the street, mm. and none of us knew him. So I, I just love that. I love that, and I think if he if he um, becomes the player of the season this year mm. on the back of his young player of the season last year, I think he'll be only be the second player to do it after Neil Roberts. I think my yeah, mate Beardy put something out before. So yeah, I mean. Uh, who, 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 would you, who would you throw your weight behind at this point? Let, let's, let's have a straw poll. Ooh. Um, ooh, I mean, I, I more or less had given that award to Lee. I'd sort of driven mm. it around his house and put it in, 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 his, uh, in his front room. Um, I think I'm going to have to take it back. I think Cannon's had a great finish to the season. I think Cleworth has done really, really well. I think if Cleworth carries on like he is to the end of the season, yeah. then I would give it to him. Uh, the the thing that's great about that is, and I keep saying it, but this is important, right? This is important for for anyone who's the parents of a young, talented kid at the moment, seeing what, uh, from North Wales or all, all beyond, seeing what's happening at the club, and thinking, right, where's my where's my where's my kid going to go? Is it going to be Everton, Liverpool, United, like it would have been for the last twenty five years, or is there a chance that this my my you know my lad can play for Wrexham? Get 
a path to the to the first team and really sort of you know really kick on at a high profile club now and I think it's really important that Max has shown that there's a way that you can do this and I do think that Max has been very lucky that a lot of young players don't get the chance or the extended run in a first team that Max has had and I think it just goes to show that if you can get that then players of his age and his talent can can really thrive and I, I think Max is a great news story for the whole of the club and it sort of points the way to how we are really going to try and build this club over over a number of, of years. And I think Max would be a good news story to give to player of the season to if it's a if it's a really close call. But you know, at the end of the day, there's two or three really good candidates and a couple of a couple of match winning goals from Lee. And <laughs> he's in it's his again, isn't it? Yeah. I I think I'm with Andy. I think for me at the moment it's Cannons. I feel like he kind of dragged us out of that rut that we were in a little bit. Um, and that felt quite important because that was a bit of a wobble that we had sort of February time in particular. Um, but yeah, as you say, there's so much that can change. I think if Clearworth pops up and scores two important headers, uh, you know, against Stockport last day of the season or next week and it wins us promotion, then who knows? It could be his. Um, Canner's going to get goal of the season, so he can't have it all. Oh yeah, true. Yeah, he could, he'd be happy with that. And I think as well with Max, one thing to note before we move on is that improvement from last season is exciting because, you know, you, and remembering that he's only 21 and you think, God, because maybe we'll come on, this is a not a topic to discuss until we know we're getting definitely going to be promoted. But, you know, what, what's going to happen to the squad next season and what's needed. And you just think, actually, Max does have that ability to, you know, his his rise is currently exponential in terms of the improvement he's having. So hopefully he can really step up um, wherever we are next season too. You no, know, he'll save us a fortune. He'll save us a fortune because you won't have to go out mm. and buy that position if you don't yeah. go into league, in League One. And also, like, we, we, we say a lot about how Parky builds the squad. Well, he's built the squad uh, at quite a high average age just because he needs to get to a certain level. Um, yeah. But it's it's nothing, there's nothing <laughs> better than seeing a, a player with potential come through. Um, and you know that there's a good resale value or you know that you might get him for the next 12, 13 years. There's there's nothing better than that. Just the, just the final thing on, on Max. We could be in uncharted territory uh, under, under the Hollywood owners um, if somebody was to come in and offer money for Max because we've not sold we've not had to sell our players to anybody in, in in this time we've not had to you know and we don't have to but then it will come down to if it's a good if it's a good business move for the club is it a good move for him personally could it be a case of somebody in the top end of the championship buys him loans him back with a development I genuinely could see it happening I genuinely I think out of everybody he's the obvious candidate to Make that leap and come yeah. back. But whether no, you're right, to, I thought, yeah. I thought I thought Tom O'Connor was our most saleable asset, but I actually think it, it, it's Max now. Now I don't want to sort of foreshadow the, the the guest we've got coming up, but we do talk about this very thing with 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 Kieran Maguire later on about about how the club can can make money out off selling players when they get to a certain level. So yeah, yeah. watch this space for that. Indeed. And before we come on to that, we've spoken about someone scoring his first league goal. Well, uh, the other goal scorer yesterday scored his 100th goal for Exum. Um, and Tim, I'm just going to read out the tweet that you put up uh, yesterday, which was bullet header, goal number 100, retrieves the ball, salutes Wrexham fans, places ball on the centre spot, ready to go again. A born winner, a Wrexham AFC legend. Um and it's it's difficult to talk about legends when they're still with us, isn't it? But I think it's it's quite clear that Paul Mullin is a, a Wrexham legend, and um, I mean, yes, they just summed him up, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's just incredible, and and the fact that it's he's you know if you looked at his his post match press, which we'll come to in a bit more detail for varying reasons in a minute, he says that yeah, I kind of oh yeah, it then dawned on me that he's like maybe that'll stop people asking me about it now. So it's not like, I don't think it's a major issue for him. And I think like everything in, for, for him, he will only look back on it with a, 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 a much bigger fondness when he's retired. He can then look back and go, I achieved this, I achieved that and achieved that. And in between, I became a published author. I did this, blah, blah, blah. He, he, he's not asked about accolades in the here and now. He's asked about getting the club 
to another award as a collective rather than a personal thing for him. So just uh, just that tells you a lot about him. It's it's all more about the team than the individual for him. And a hundred goals is insane. And you know, I just hope he, he takes time to sit down today or tomorrow and and, and look through the plaudits because he's very very modest but you can't deny he, he deserves it he's, he's got everything and I mean where's he where's he going to stop you know where's he going to stop can he get another hundred it's probably unlikely but I think we can probably get at least another 50 or 60 from him well that that would be class wouldn't it and let, let, yeah let's come on to that press conference um not press conference sorry post-match interview he did um and he's going to play a little clip from it that um we all thought was very interesting Sure we done with his travel everywhere, supporting us, and the support they give us is brilliant. But one thing I do never want to hear them singing again is about us win, not winning away from home. Or we, you, you, how much do you be? We never win away. Like, what do they think that does to the to the players who are on the pitch representing their team? I don't know. I know it's all about fun and games and having a good time. While you're tra- well, you deserve to have a good time when you travel and pay your hard earned money to come watch us. But I think um, some of the lads have been uh, speaking about them. I mean, they don't really like to hear that, but the support from them is unbelievable, and I think that was a lovely moment. Now, for those of you who don't speak fluent Scouse and uh, who don't quite couldn't quite understand that fantastic audio quality from phone to microphone, um, that was Paul Mullin saying that he was very grateful for the support yesterday, but wasn't very. The team weren't thrilled with one of the chants. Tim, do you want to tell us what that chant is? Uh, okay, so can you give me the floor for maybe four or five minutes here? Because no, don't. Just get on with it. <laughs> no, I need to. I, I need to have my say on this because it's been bugging me for the last hour and a bit. Well, tell um, us what it is first, and then, then well, give us. Uh, so, so there's technically there's two that he's referred to in in that those comments. So there's the the who we're the Rex and the mighty Rex and we never win away, and then the chant turns into we win away, we win away to the who in the jungle, the mighty jungle, the lion sleeps tonight, which initially started out as a kind of like an ode to Andy Cannon because of the who Lion King thing. So, and then further from that, it's just become a bit of a, a self-deprecating song about our, our you know perceived inabilities on the road. And you know, we we we've only, we haven't. I think we won eight on the road, so it's not not a massive thing. I mean, you could arguably change it to we never score away because I think we scored twenty four goals in twenty two get away games or something. So there's that aspect. Then there's the other one, which is um, how shit must you be? We're winning away. So again, it's tongue in cheek. And it's mostly, as far as I'm, when I, I when it when those piped up yesterday, it was when we were winning, and it always seems to be sung when we're winning. So it's self-deprecating humour from the fans about because you know, we're so good at home and um, we've been a little bit, we've been very inconsistent away. There's no, there's no shine away from it. You know, this week alone, for the best part of what 190 minutes, we fashioned a, ha- a handful of chances. Doncaster was, wasn't very good, a couple of chances, and then we, we were very, very dour for the first 45 to 60 minutes yesterday. However, um, I, I look, Paul Mullin walks on water. He's got 100 goals. However, he fell into that water a little bit yesterday for me. We don't tell Paul Mullin how to score goals. Don't tell fans what they shouldn't, should and shouldn't think, sing, right? What, what, where's it stopping to tell us what we should and shouldn't wear to a game yet? Doesn't sit right with me. I don't like it. Um, if you're telling me that, that uh, a couple of chants about uh, a supposed um, being not very good in the road is going to affect the player's mentality, then I'd be quite worried about the player's mentality. I, I don't see how, how... Is that a little bit of pressure getting getting to the players? I don't know. I just think people are saying, oh, he scored 100 goals, he's a talisman, he can say whatever he likes. I'm inclined to agree to a certain point. However, I think those comments were misguided at, uh, at at best, foolish at worst. I just don't, it just doesn't sit right with me. I just don't see how he can come out, not understand the humour behind it. He's a very funny guy. He's very dry witted. If he and the players don't get the irony of it, um, then it says more about them than it does the fans. I, I just think it's it's dangerous territory to start slagging off a fan base that from the first whistle to the last yesterday got behind him. It was non stop singing, non stop singing. The it drum. wasn't. He was yeah, the drum wasn't far from Manny with the drum. At half time, there was a few grumbles, but unjustifiably so because we we hadn't got going and were bullied against the team fighting for their lives, and we just thought, is this another rinse repeat of the Doncaster game? So it was frustrating. However, 
for the most part, it's all positive. It's all positive, always has been. So yeah. you can't bookend a, a chant that's supposedly negative in the eyes of the players and get called out for it. I think it was a it was a bad move on his part. Andy, thoughts? Uh, two things on this. One, it's a it's a interview that's just happened at the end of the game, so you know the, his emotion is still running high a little bit. Um, I, I don't think he's full on blasting the fans. I just think he heard something and he didn't like it. Now, the thing that we like about Paul Mullin is it ju- he just it's not just that he scores goals. He's a talisman for the club off the pitch as well. That's because he's quite forthright with his views. He was very forthright with the fuck the Tory stuff. He does a lot for the autism, and we 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 like that sort of stuff because we feel he he talks for us now. Sometimes he feels that he has to call something out that he doesn't like and he won't stop just because he shouldn't do it. So I I understand him doing it. Do I agree with him? Probably not. No, I think it was a piss take. I think I enjoyed that singing that chant. It it was funny. I mean, and, and Tim's right. We absolutely backed them all yesterday. That drum, that drummer, fair play to him. He started at the first minute and carried through to the, to the 95th. It was a brilliant atmosphere there yesterday. And we are a little bit of a piss take sometimes, yeah. but we don't mean any harm by it. Shall I, I, offer, think, the I, counter, think, shall I, I offer the counterpoint to you? Um, uh, I, I, I understand. I think you're, you're both uh, right. And, you know, uh, I, but, but did it not give you pause for thought? If Paul Mullen is saying... The team don't like that chant. It winds us up. Is what he's basically saying. He's saying we don't like it. So why continue singing it? Is, stop, is, is, do, yeah. stop listening to the chants and get on playing the game. String five passes together. So why are you chant? But, 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 but that's why you chant, isn't it? You chant to support the team. But we ninety percent of the time we do, and then sometimes you can have a bit of a laugh with it. If we're serious yeah. all the time in the stands, you're never going to enjoy it. It's totally as simple get that. as that. But the worry no. I've got is that if you start getting outspoken about about um, the sort of things on the on the periphery of the game, chance, whatever. It's not. It wasn't offensive. It's not. Offensive. No, it wasn't offensive. No, of course. So not. the minute you start doing that, you you then give more voice to a player who can then decide what you should and shouldn't do. And I think there's a balance between player power and fan power, and you have to get it right. And the reason it's mm. become a bit storm in the teacup, and the reason I'm so animated about it, is because we we've had we've had such a good relationship with the player, especially him. For, for him to, to come and sort of admonish us as a, as a collective was surprising as it was disappointing personally. But it's a storm in a, in a teacup. That song will probably never be sung again. Well, that was like my next said, question. Yeah. Well, it is the Messiah and it won't be sung again. And and I'm fine. It's, mm. it's not, not not the be all and end all. I, I, I'd probably quite happily put the uh, how shit must she be we're winning an eight race on because it's crap, isn't it? But... The, uh, the Lion King. Yeah, the, 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 other, the first so one, the we win away one, I think is less yeah. of an issue. It's, I, it's, uh, a laugh. It, it's just a laugh. Exactly. Makes total sense. But the That's the one uh, I heard most yesterday. That was yeah. the prevalent one. Yeah. Uh, not how, There was a few how shit must you be we're winning away, but it was more the, the Lion King. I don't know if he heard the last bit, which is we're winning away, we're winning we're away, winning yeah, away yeah. we're winning yeah. away. I don't know if he's no, heard that. But I, but I, and it's, I suppose it just gives to that point because you know you 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 hear it sometimes, don't you? When you're playing the team at the bottom of the league and they're they're winning, and it's like you know how shit must you be? We win, every, well, we lose every week, it, kind of thing. It's but, a storm in a teacup. It'll be of course forgotten it is. About by Tuesday. Well, all right, all right, Tim. But you had your five minute monologue, so I'm just I'm just <laughs> making my point, which you keep interrupting, which sorry, is sorry, sorry. Which, which is the the point that I think that maybe some people don't get is like you know. Of course, everyone is totally allowed to sing whatever they want. You can sing whatever you want as long as it's not offensive and you know discriminatory. Um, but if your purpose is there to support the team, uh, and there's something being sung that I, I always hear, it's, and I, I, it's always been the way I, I felt about booze, to be honest, because unless a team is like actually clearly not trying. And you've got players that are walking around the pitch. I've never understood the purpose of booze, especially with this team we've had, which I think whatever you say about them, even when they're playing poorly, and this is in the three seasons we've had sort of under Parky, there's never a lack of effort there. Sometimes they play badly, but they're always running their socks off. Paul Mullin, for example, has bad games, but he's constantly running. And so I do not see any reason to boo. I just think it's totally counterintuitive. They go into the changing rooms feeling crap, feeling that the fan base is not behind them. And and I think that there are some chants that maybe, even though they're totally inoffensive, self-deprecating, 
quite funny, but actually, if you're on the pitch, you kind of go, "No, what? Cheers, lads." Do you know what I mean? It's it's like we're we're busting the gut here, and and you're kind of taking the piss out of us. I, maybe it is. Maybe they have got a bit of a thin skin, but I think, you know, I, think, I can see I where they're coming from. You you can dig deep into the sort of psycho psychology of of fan chants and this and the other, but maybe there's there's something to be said for the fact that we were singing so much before the game had even started. Then it mm. was consistent. Then we had the knockback of the goal, took the wind out of the sails a bit, tried to get it going again in the second half. And then when we equalised, it was like an explosion of just noise. So it was mm. like, the gloves are off. Let's sing everything yeah, now. Yeah. Let's get everything going again. So I think there was elements of, well, we sang those 10 songs already 20 times. Let's do this one because we haven't done it. A bit of variety keeps the atmosphere yeah. going. Yeah. So I think there's elements of that to it as well, yeah. just to keep everybody fresh. With Everybody wants, everybody doesn't want to do, oh, you know, um, yeah. Lay, lay, lay for the 50th, 50th time. Well, I was so. going to say that is another thing because I do get bored with the same chants that are basically yeah. just copies from other clubs. So a bit of bit of difference is always good. Um, yeah. Oh, we need Jacko. Jacko would have sorted this out. <laughs> we really do. And actually, one thing I would say is obviously watching um, yesterday, um, the atmosphere sounded fantastic. It sounded like one of the best in a while, Andy. Was that? Yeah, it was. Fair? It was great. I loved it. Can I just say right? Um, so I went to the game with a couple of uh, a couple of uh, friends from Essex, Essex Dave and his mate Pete. And Pete brought his lad. Now his lad uh, has been to a couple of Spurs games. Maybe he went to a couple of Colchester games when there was only three thousand. This is the first time he's ever been in an away end, and I could tell on that lad's face he absolutely loved it. The singing, the drama, the people jumping up and down, the drum going on for ninety minutes. We, we went back to Pete's house. He put the documentary on straight away. Pete says this morning that Wrexham's now his second club. That lad loved that atmosphere, all right? It's mm. a great atmosphere. It's the sort yeah. of thing that makes you fall in love with football. So, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to apologise for, for that. Yeah, okay, maybe maybe in hindsight. I do I do agree with you a little bit, Reese. to be honest. But I, I do sort of think that, that, that the first one, the, to, to uh, we win away one, I think it is a piss take where, where, where we yeah. are actually... In the end, we're saying we are winning away. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it's it's a fine line. Yeah, no, I agree. And also, it didn't feel like it crossed it at all. But um, and a bit of self deprecation is always good and it's always enjoyable. But it, it's you know it's interesting in that sometimes perception is everything, right? And if that's how the yeah. team perce- perceives it, then it's like okay, well, fair enough. Um, but anyway, an interesting talking point, nevertheless. Let's let's rattle through some of the other ones quickly because we've gone on about that for a while. I mean, obviously, Lee on the bench was quite a big call, right, Andy? Um, obviously, he ended up coming on quite quickly in the end, probably sooner than Parky would have wanted because of <laughs> Mendy's injury. But um, was that the right call, do you think? For Lee on the bench, yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, and we, let's not talk too much about Doncaster. It's, it, it's gone now. But Lee wasn't great against Doncaster. He looked tired. And if you looked at... Someone put um, someone put the minutes per, per season up on Twitter, and Lee's more or less played every every minute. You know the lad looked tired, and you sort of think, right, okay, if Lee has to come out, who have you got to come in? Well, I'm, unfortunately, Jordan, Jordan Davis isn't there yet, um, uh, and so it, it isn't going to be Jordan. So the next thing to do to keep the balance that the Parky likes is to put McLean there, and I, we just sort of suggested in the pub beforehand, and I was very surprised that that Parky did do those changes. But I thought there was a nice balance to us. Um, unfortunately, Mendy didn't have a brilliant game and then and, and then got injured. So I think, yes, just even giving uh, Lee that 30 minutes he didn't have to play might 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 be, might supercharge him a little bit. And also shows him that you know he's he's not gonna he's not in this he's not gonna walk into the side every every match. There is a you know if if you do have a couple of poor games you will you will get taken out even though you your uh, most creative midfielder. Oh, you reached you on mute. Damn it, it's been so long since I did that. Um and he came on obviously for Mendy in the end, Tim, as we mentioned, who looks like he's tweaked or done something nasty to his hamstring. Another injury. Um it's a bit of a blow, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is, you know, back in after a period out and then yeah, it's just just pulled up and he looked decent early doors, you know, looking a bit get a bit of width and go out his marker. What can you say? We just seem to be having rotten luck with injuries and yeah, it's it's um it's a blow. It's a blow, but you know what? 
even even that very very minuscule rest for Lee probably did him a little little tiny bit of good because he looked all right. <laughs> he looked sharper when he came on. Looked there we go. Than um, I, I, one thing you'll say about Lee is he's a he's you can tell he's a bit like Mullen, right? He's such a competitor. You can tell that he wants to be on the pitch all the time, um, and probably that that being dropped hurt him a bit. And it was probably the right call as well from a man management perspective. <laughs> yeah, and and it probably did. But then he, he's probably sensible enough to to, to go. You're probably right. I probably yeah. do need a bit of a breather. It was just it's not quite the same with toes really you know, earlier on in the season, needed that break because of everything that was going off away from the pitch for, for, for him. So it's wise to, to 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 give him a breather. I mean, anybody with two eyes could see that he was chasing shadows at, at, at Donny, Elliot Lee. It was just like, ah, we want the old Elliot Lee back, not not what we've got right now. So you don't become a bad player overnight. And I've said this before that Elliot Lee set the bar so high early part of the season with all those goals and the performances that anything slightly below that level, all of a sudden it's a disaster because you expect mm. so much more from him. And do not be surprised to see those key players, the likes of you, you know, Mullin and, and Lee and the, the big game players really, really coming back to the surface in these final few games because we're going to need them. Yeah. Um. Great. Let's go straight to our guest. Um, Andy and Liam interviewed Kira Maguire, who's been on the podcast before. Um, he uh, runs a podcast called The Price of Football and he analyses the accounts of football clubs. And those three delved a little deeper into Wrexham's accounts, which we touched on last week. So um, here's that interview. Uh, Croeso, welcome to a Phyllis and Devotion. I wouldn't say mini pod. I wouldn't say emergency pod. I, I'm going to say an explainer pod. So basically, we did quite a bit on the finances on Sunday, but but there were more questions than answers. Remember that um, question of sport mystery guest, the song Liam. Is that too is that too young for you? No, I watched that. I'm yeah, yeah. quite old. Do you want now. Me to sing it for you? Should we have more singing in this pod? <laughs> Actually, let's have less singing. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go any, anywhere near that. But anyway, uh we're joined by by Kira Maguire from the Price of Football um podcast. Uh so this is Kieran's probably busiest, busiest time of the year. All the football accounts came out, and last week he was tweeting about Wrexham's account. Um so there was a couple of like headline things that we we sort of picked up on. Um you know, firstly was the revenue 10.5 million record for a, for a national league. There's also the wages, the losses, and a loan. So, Kieran, if we don't mind, we'll sort of go through them bit by bit. But firstly, the revenue 10.5 million. That must be a, a lot more than than what a national league club has ever made, isn't it? Do you do you know sort of revenue turnover wise what what a, a your normal sort of non league, even an ex league club would would make down there? Yeah, if, if we take a look at the other clubs in the National League, um, most of them are generating between one and three million pounds a year. Uh, you don't uh, you don't have any money coming in from the TV deal as such. I mean, it's, it's effectively you, know, you might get ten or fifteen grand a season. That compares to a, a million pounds you'd be getting in uh, in League Two. So there's a big step down from League Two to the National League. Clearly, you've got the issue of attendances, but of course. Uh, Wrexham have had magnificent attendances in the in the National League, uh, yeah, both pre and post takeover. We have to be honest about that. But the, yeah. the takeover has had a, a positive impact upon that. Um, so ten and a half million pounds is 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 not only a record for the uh, the National League; it will have exceeded uh, any other club in League Two in twenty twenty three, and it's probably would pitch. Wrexham at around about sort of top eight, top ten in League One, and that's before you take into consideration all of the benefits that you would get from being in that division. Yeah, yeah. So the next, the next sort of big sort of headline figure is wages, six point nine million, which again is a huge amount. Now, I just want to say a caveat on this. Really, I think Wrexham have got a very clear plan of what they wanted to do to get out of the National League and to get out of probably League Two. And I think they were buying players, um, maybe older, more experienced players, maybe players with less sell-on value. And they were trying to, you know, the the way they were attracting them down to non-league was by giving them good 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 cash, but also three-year deals. And I think that sort of skewed the wages a little bit. And I think really... 
they may change tack if they get into League One because that's that's a leveling out, really. I think I think at some point Wrexham are going to have to look about buying players in, buying potential, buying players of resale value, uh, maybe building a little bit more than the fast track, and also looking to bring in bring in the youth players. But so do you sort of understand that? Maybe they've been paying a little bit too much on wages just to get them to the to the, to the level they they want to get to quickly. I, I think there certainly was a determination by the owners to, to accelerate Wrexham through the national league, like ideally through League Two as well, because uh, I think we've seen other clubs that have gone up. You, you you've seen uh, Stockport County this season; they're having a fantastic season. They've they've not been in um, in, in that division very long either. Um, and they've also had owners who have come in and, and have put in money. In the National League, it is possible to recruit players from League One, play them League One wages, and get promoted as a result because there's not the equivalent of financial fair play. And that works in the National League, and that works to a certain extent in League Two as well. You can you can outbid the vast majority of the clubs, given that Wrexham have got higher revenues. I think you're absolutely right that you then reach a plateau um, in League One because, no disrespect, you can't go out and sign players on championship wages. The average wage in the championship is around twelve to fourteen thousand pounds a week. Now, I've got a rough idea of what Wrexham are paying. You've got a rough idea of what Wrexham are paying, and it's nowhere near that. So you you, you therefore have to to compete with the other. 23 clubs in, in League One, you know, that's if the club gets promoted to uh, the, the League One next season. And then you take a look around and just look at some of the clubs who you potentially could be competing with. You know, if Sheffield Wednesday get relegated, well, you know, they, they're averaging crowds of 25,000. You've got Derby County there this season. You've got Bolton Wanderers there this season. Portsmouth, they're all clubs who are very sizable in their own right. And therefore, I, I think you will find that the, the, the advantages of having the, the accelerators, which have come as a result of the takeover, and I think the feel-good factor in the town. And, and I, was, I was, I'm old enough to remember, I, I was actually at sort of Fans United Day um, at the race course ground in, what was it, 2004, 2005? Uh, I'm, I'm a Brighton fan, and I think we, we liaised with you. So we, we, we've seen the, the, the potential. Of, of what the club can achieve in terms of having a really committed fan base and so on. Um, all of a sudden, you're now on a level playing field with um, a significant number of clubs in League One, and it gets that much harder. Yeah. Um, right, so the next sort of headline is the losses, 5.1 million. I mean, that sounds like a huge amount in it, for the National League, but, you know, I was looking at some of the other sort of tweets that you were you were popping out that day. I think Fleetwood, six million. Uh, even Doncaster lost lost two million. So it's not it's it, it, it's not massively different from from the, from that level of clubs. I think what we sort of need to take into account that this is last season and I think even since then our revenue streams have probably probably improved. The key question is uh the club say look we won't be making losses as big as that again. So can we bridge the gap? Is is the uh, how easy is it to uh, to wipe out losses of of um, of that magnitude in the next financial year? Um, I think wiping them out might be a step too far. No, maybe the wrong for, for, for leveling them up a little bit. Yeah, I think yeah. maybe yeah. Um, I think saying that this could be peak losses for a season or two. Um, that that probably is a valid comment. Um. Those revenues of ten and a half million pounds uh, in the national league, I'd expect them to be closer to fifteen in in League One. All of a sudden, you've got the Premier League TV, so you've got the EFL TV deal. You've got solidarity payments from the Premier League. You've got more away fans coming. You've got the continued success in terms of the involvement with the owners, all of which have created a, a virtuous circle. Uh, the sponsors are willing to pay more. Uh, for having a season in League Two, because you will be chosen uh, for live broadcasts, you you will be on different highlight shows, which it gives exposure to those sponsors and those commercial partners, and and you're going to sell out um, every match as well, as far as the stadium is concerned. So there'll be more money going in, there'll be more money uh, being spent because 
the players will be incentivized. You know, there will be significant promotion bonuses, for example. And you know, when we talk about those losses, as far as um, 22, 23 are concerned, part of the reason why the wage bill was so high, because players do get significant bonuses. You know, if you hadn't gone up, the wage bill would have been a lot lower. But yeah, yeah. I think every single Wrexham fan will be saying, well, we're quite happy to, to pay that because the, the players deserved it. The players delivered. Um, as far as the the objectives at the start of the season were concerned, so um, five million pounds by League Two standards is is high, but you know I, I've looked at you know, clubs that you don't even think about, the likes of Colchester. They they lose you know, three or four million every year. They've lost wow. total total of around about thirty five thirty six million, and and their their owners put that in. Um, e even the smaller clubs, the likes of Accrington and so on, who are who are trying to compete on tiny attendances, they will be losing the thick end of a million a year. So, well, welcome to the the brutal reality of the finances of of EFL football. Um, you're you're not going to get rich um, running a football club. It, it's just that what what you've got to decide on is how poor uh, if you're the owner. Uh, are you prepared to let, let that, uh, that ownership take it? Um, this brings us nicely to our next sort of uh, point, which is the loan. Now, um, this is, I wouldn't say a bugbear, but this is something that been, um, has been highlighted because when Ryan and Rob did their initial Zoom presentation, um, they said that there won't be any loans. Uh, they, they wouldn't be doing loans to the club. Uh, so that's changed. And I think it's changed because of the COP, the delays to the COP, the fact that they weren't, they didn't get levelling up money. So um, I think, yes, we can sort of see that they did need to sort of move capital around. Now, um, it's, an, it's a loan of $9 million. It's being charged at the standard variable rate plus 3%. Uh, it's probably for the COP. Um, and when we sort of discussed it during during Sunday, there was a bit sort of a bit of to and froing about was this a risk or not. Now I've been doing a little bit of work into it, and I'm sure you, Kieran, you you know more about this than me. But it does seem to me that maybe it isn't as much of a risk, and it does seem sort of normal practice in in this sort of sense. Um... Yes, <laughs> my view is that if you go and buy a house, you can take out a mortgage. You don't get castigated for it. You, know, you, you accept that if you want to invest in property, if, if you want to uh, expand your, your property or real estate portfolio or however you want to describe it, then it's going to cost money. How can that money come into the club? Well, the club can either make profits. We know that's not the case as far as um, the uh, as, as Rex were concerned. And it, would, it wouldn't be the case for any club in, in the lower leagues that they generate enough profit to fund a, a, a new stand. You can have the owners putting money in in the form of shares. Now, as as far as uh, you know, Reynolds and McKenney are concerned, they they've already put in a large amount. Um, is it is it realistic to expect them to wholly fund the the expansion through increased shares? I I, I don't really think so. So then you go down the the lending route and the difference between shares and lending is that if, uh, if if the club issues shares to the owners then there's never any obligation for the company uh, or the club to repay that money whereas there is a potential repayment opportunity um if if, if the, the money is advanced in the form of loans i think the only thing which slightly took me aback was was the fact that they are charging interest at a okay. you know, fairly significant rate, you know, um, it's it, it's still cheaper than borrowing from a bank. So you know the argument that the uh, Reynolds and McCann will put forward, and, and remember that that they're there as investors. That you know, I think some some owners come in as sugar daddies, but nobody's claiming that they've got the type of wealth of uh, Bet three six five in respect of Stoke or Roman Abramovich had. In respect of Chelsea or, or what we see at, at Manchester City, we are talking about, you know, ultimately it's two individuals who are very successful in their own particular industry, but they've, they've got a limit and they, they've got other responsibilities as far as their finances is concerned. So um, I, I can understand why there might be a bit of snarkiness um, from, from some parties with regards to the interest on the loans, but I don't think what they're asking for is unreasonable. And 
the positives of their overall investment outweigh any negatives by by a factor of a hundred or a thousand, surely. Yeah. Um, so once we sort of discussed this badly on on Sunday, by the way. Uh, so thank you for <laughs> thank you for shedding some light on this. Uh, I've had a few emails, and one has come in from a guy called Mox, and I just want to read parts of it, and I, I will do it in bits because it's quite a long in. Uh, email. Uh, so basically, Mock says, in order to understand Robin Ryan's approach, I think you need to know venture capitalism investment model, which me and Liam do not. So uh, so thanks for that, Mox. Um, Ryan will try to apply his experience from that world to Wrexham. Think of Wrexham as a 160-year-old startup. Right. He says... He gives an example here. Say you found a company right out the gates. There's a bunch of expenses. Maybe in the first year you spend 50K of your own money. The company takes off. You find someone to give you a 250K investment. You give them 25% of the ownership. Your company is now worth a million pounds. Now you're at the races, but I'm sure you'd like to get your 50K back because it's your wealth tied in the business. But you and your investor want to pay the full 250 into growing the business. So rather than take the 50K out as a cash repayment, you take it as a loan called a founder's loan. Right. Liam, are you understanding this? Uh, you've come, you lost me at founder's loan. <laughs> well, good, because founder's loan was at the end. So I, I'm, I'm taking that <laughs> as a win. Kieran, is this making sense so far? Yeah, I think, I think what effectively what, what that person is saying is that initially the investment into Wrexham Football Clubs by uh, Ryan, and, Ryan Reynolds and McElhenney um, was in the form of shares. The benefit of that was that there was no week by week, month by month cost to the club. The club succeeded on the back of that. It needed further investment. And what they've now said is that our, our second tranche of investment yeah. into Wrexham Football Club is coming. There's slightly more strings attached, but hold on, you know, don't forget what we've, what we've already done for you. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's effectively the, the position. Um, and if if Wrexham, Wrexham are successful and they sell out in League Two and they sell out in League One, the additional revenues generated by stadium expansion, all the benefits that go with that, you know, creating fan zones, creating. Uh, a, a scenario where people will arrive at the ground half an hour early and, and stay half an hour later, and that's what Spurs have done, for example. Yeah, with, they've with their, their yeah. and, and they, they they make you know we, we know it's a question of scale, but they're making a million pounds a match from catering alone because they've created an environment and facilities which make it really attractive for people to stick around the stadium. So I think that's probably the vision of the two investors. Um, they 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 are enjoying it. Yeah, you know, okay, they're actors. They they could they, they could be faking it for the cameras. And let's face it, we probably wouldn't know. But um, they 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 certainly appear to be enjoying it. They've got an emotional investment and a financial investment. But we also have to remember that there is a financial investment. It's it's not the the same scenario as local business person who's been a lifelong fan wins the lottery or, or sells out their business and, and therefore decides to to put it into the local football club. This is a different arrangement. Um, they, they've been generous with their expertise. They've been generous with their brand. They've been generous with their initial uh, investment into the club. And now they're saying, okay, the club's yeah. benefited as a result. We're, we're entitled to a bit of payback. No, I mean, I mean, Mox does go on to say it's reasonable to charge a market rate interest for the loan because you shouldn't be loaning money over an uncertain length of time at a loss, even if it is your own company. That way you can you recoup your initial investments without having to sell off more of the company. Um, he says, uh, right, OK, sorry, I, I know this is quite long, but I've just got two more sentences to read from this. If Ryan and Ryan, Ryan Rob sell the club, uh, sell 20% of the club for 15 million, they're going to want all of that money invested into the club. They've been very clear that any sale of equity in the club would be for strategic growth purposes, not so they can cash out. But 9 million is a lot of money, even for those guys, so they can slowly re repay their loan over time in a way which won't be disruptive or damaging to the club and eventually will mean they'll get their initial ca cash out laid back. Right. I think I understand that. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mox, for that. Um, uh, but yeah, for me, that sort of proves that they're in it for the long term. You, you, you're absolutely right. Um, again, it was sort of a, a benchmark against my club and 
you know, we, we've been at the, the arse end of, of League Two. We've nearly been in the National League. Um, we've got an owner that's lent the club 400 million quid. And I, I can't give any details, but I have seen the accounts for Brighton, which are going to surprise quite a few people. And they probably reach the stage now where he's entitled to, to recoup some of that 400 million quid. Not a lot of it, not anything that's going to put the club at risk. And I suspect we'll, what we're going to see, admittedly, with perhaps yeah, one, one or two less zeros, we're going to see exactly the same approach taken by uh, uh, Reynolds and McElhenney. You won't find any Brighton fans bitching about what the Brighton owner's done. And you know, my view that Wrexham fans should, should probably have a similar view to, to what, what you have experienced in, in terms of the enjoyment which their investment has given so many fans in, in the last few years. Um, I don't want to keep you too much longer, Kieran, but we got one last question. Um, and it's a question that Liam asked me on Sunday. How much does a new stand cost? Uh, I went 7 million and was blown out the water. <laughs> Tim went 17 million. And then Liam hit us with, with the sum of, go on, Liam, you say it. I can't even say it. So it was 37.4 million. So just for a bit of context, this is a 5,500 seater stand, which incorporates conferencing facilities, um, sort of all sort of all singing, all dancing. It's also up to UEFA international standards. Um, there's a lot of these requirements are because it is receiving the injection of public money into it. So it has to have sort of public benefits to it as well. <laughs> If that's the cost, that's the cost. I mean, certainly when I talk to, I, I work in the city of Liverpool, so you're not far away from Wrexham, um, the cost of developing the new Everton Stadium has you know, doubled, almost trebled so in, in the five or six years since we started. Um, raw material prices have gone through the roof. The cost of transporting those raw materials around the world has gone through the roof. We've got the impact on, on the labour market due to, and this isn't political comment, due to Brexit, due to the Ukraine war, um, yeah, which means that trying to get hold of, of, of skilled staff is becoming more complicated, so it becomes uh, more expensive, and then you've just got your, your day-to-day overheads. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised um, if you want to, if you, you try building a house today compared to yeah. five, ten years ago. Um, you, you have to get in at the right time. And unfortunately, today is not the right time, but it's not going to get any cheaper going forwards. Yeah, I think there's yeah. figures of sort of a million pound inflation covered in there, around 3.7, which was to do with site preparation and clearing and new floodlights. There's quite a lot detailed in there. Um, one one question... thing I wouldn't mind saying is um, I will build that stand for 7.25 million. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I will guarantee that. <laughs> um, I've put up shelves before. I'm I'm pretty sure I can bring it in. Pop down to uh, IKEA, so... make a start. Yep, absolutely. Just 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 come to me. Uh, I did have one quick question. Just on, it was noticed recently that um, it's listed on the club's website that R R McReynolds, which is essentially the parent company, now owns ninety five percent of Wrexham Football Club, as opposed to to five percent and. It's actually quite difficult uh, because of where the club's registered in the US to to discover where this 5% goes. What sort of reasons might there be for um, selling off a small chunk of the club, as it were? Yeah, I mean, as, as far as the parent company based in the US is concerned, the, the disadvantage of, of dealing with the US is that it's not a very transparent country. Uh, for, for all of the things that we whinge about in the UK, uh, the ability to nerd out at company's house, which is effectively my life, is uh, is something which can be quite revealing. What has probably happened is that somebody's come along to the tour owners and says, we'd like to give you a little bit of cash because we like what you're doing at Wrexham. Um, and indirectly, we, we want to get involved. Manchester City have done that. You know, they, they, 15% of Manchester City is owned by an American investment house. Uh, we, we've seen the same at uh, Manchester United. You, you see the same actually taking place at quite a few clubs is now that people see what's going on. They like what's going on and they're willing to put their money where their mouth is. The, the existing owners still have control. These people 
are effectively they're there for the ride. Yeah, I think a lot of the, the I think the thing to say about a lot of this is, as you say, for us it's all quite quite new because we're used to the days of hundred yeah. uh, percent supporters ownership. And, well, various percentages of ownership by less than uh yeah, we won't talk about the previous owners, but <laughs> yes, yeah, the previous owners kept us all awake, I think. Yeah. It? So I think I mean we've always kept a kept a close track on these things because naturally we we we've had to really, but <laughs> I think the I suppose the thing to say is that these things naturally do happen and it's not always a case for alarm, but perhaps just I think from my perspective, I sometimes just wish, you know, communication's a bit better, just so you so you're not going, oh, what's that about? What's that about? <laughs> I, I always think it's it's better for clubs to be proactive than reactive. And and I think one of the one of the faults that many owners make is that they don't realise that your investment in Wrexham Football Club, which is effectively cradle to grave, let's be honest, um, means that you you want to be there as a critical friend. You want to be there effectively. As a, you know, that's the role of a non-executive director. You, you're not there to stir the shit. You're not there to, to make things awkward. Um, and for some people who have always been used to getting their own way without having to answer questions, to go into that environment in, in terms of owning a football club is alien. And that's where I think communication can fail. Yeah, no, I think that sums it up pretty well. Great. Um, Kieran, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you've really explained things to me, the, me the layman. Uh, I think, uh, I think, uh, yeah, there was a couple of things that we were scratching our head on, but but thank you. You've really put it into, into contest for us. It's a Price of Football uh, podcast every week, Kieran. That's tw- twice a week, sometimes three. Twice it, a week. It, it, it shouldn't it shouldn't be necessary, but it's it, it's ridiculously successful. We've had what 12, 13 million downloads. We. Oh, we've got wow. no idea. We we even go on mini tours. You know, we're visiting some some. We've done visits to Plymouth, Argyle, Leicester, Accrington, Stanley, Wimbledon, uh, Clapton or Clapton. I don't know. We, we, we lose track. Uh, but we come to Wrexham. We, we, come to Wrexham. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll William Ashton us. Hall. We'll, yeah. we'll do it. Okay. Thanks so much. Plan. Thanks Thank so you. much for your for your time. Cheers, Kieran. Okay. Um, thanks again to Kieran Maguire for his time. Um, really interesting stuff. Um, Tim, the women um, are in action currently, aren't they? Um, so we don't know the results no. yet. Well, yeah. The, this by, by the time we're, we're putting this out, they're kicking off a little on little later on today against Cardiff. Final game of the season. Cardiff, who I don't think they've beaten any four attempts this year in, in both league and cup attempts. But another good test to, to see out what has been a great season for them. You know, the, in the top flight. And they will go from strength to strength. That's the that's the expectation and the hopes. So long may it continue. And hopefully, you know, Wrexham will have some Welsh representation in the, the Wales women's squad, which obviously they played in front of 4,000 people at the Kairos earlier this week. Tramped Croatia uh, 4-0. Really good performance. Um, penny for Rob Page's thoughts as he saw some attacking football from a Wales side. Oh, whoa, what a little dig. Whoa. Am I, um, funny enough, good mate of mine, Baz, um, travelled up with his with his daughter, who I think is six. Um, Billy, she's a massive um, Wales football fan, um, and they made the the journey up in one in one day and back that night. Um, and I just thought, how great that you've got football like that at the racecourse again, because you know people will travel from all over the country. And she had an she had an absolute whale of a time. Obviously, you know, winning that comfortably. Um, and yeah, it was just great great to see. Um, now, a couple more housekeeping bits. We're going to talk about what we need to do to get promoted and preview the next few games. But before that, Tim, you've got some um, housekeeping to do. Yeah, a few bits. Um, just wanted to give a, a big shout out to uh, Andy, who does the All Gone Hollywood and All Gone Sonic Ironic um, uh, Twitter uh, and Twitter accounts. He last week he completed, I think it was 53 walks, 53 consecutive five, five mile walks. All for charity, raised over four grand for the the miners' rescue in Wrexham, whilst telling the story of of um, the colliery and the miners. And, and there's just he did video after video after video, and you can view every one of those videos in full now um, on YouTube. So go go and look him up. And he deserves a lot of credit for that. It's not easy to to get out of bed every day and go, I'm going to do five mile walk today and put a piece to video and give a history lesson, a very important history lesson in the process. So massive shout out to him. He deserves it. Give him a round of applause when you see him, buy him a pint. Um, well done, that man. So yeah, big shout out to him. 
And the other thing I kind of wanted to discuss really is, um, I mean, it kind of almost feels like we've done a fair few of these this year um, in terms of uh, minute silences and minutes applause and everything else. Um, but we lost somebody earlier, uh, well, just late on last month. Now. I think it was earlier this month, I can't remember. But a lad, um, David Roberts, who's known to as Neil, Jacko, I think to a few others. He was 55, uh, passed away. He's from the, the Carrog area. Massive, massive, massive Wrexham and Wales fan. Um, yeah, very sad. Passed away on the 20th of March. Um, so the thing that we're looking to do, um, and his family have, 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 uh, have asked to do it as well, is to, if everybody can give him a, a minute's applause on the 55th minute, because he died age 50, 55, not 56, is, is his birthday um, next month. So if you can give a, a, a big, massive round of applause for him on the 55th minute, is that'll be a huge comfort to his family. But I'll uh, I'll pin it back up on the on Twitter. But yeah, just a yeah, really nice guy. So just uh, sad sad to see that you know, this really bad disease that got a hold of him and yeah, cut his life tragically short. Really. So just thoughts are with his family and yeah, let's let's give him a good send off in the 55th minute against against Crawley, please. Yeah, well said. And uh, yeah, thinking of his family at the moment um uh one thing to touch on before we talk about those last four games is the time for the crew game has changed hasn't it tim <laughs> yeah yeah is it 12 30 now um yeah i mean i i know there was there was a little bit of outcry people saying oh, i bought me tickets now i think it's a it's a it's a mild inconvenience it's not a wild inconvenience it's not exeter away yeah i can get that um <laughs> Well, it depends you know. where you're coming from, Tim. Uh, I'm well, yeah, all right. Yeah, I, I, I keep I keep forgetting that that we've got. You got a direct trade the crew, Andy. Stop moaning. Yeah, exactly. Just change um, it. Having a lot of, a lot of London Reds had already booked in advance, but okay, yeah, fair okay. enough. It should you should be able to change it to an off peak. I mean, th- there are train tickets still available. Um, that is an inconvenience, to be fair. Trains on the hour, every hour, about five or six before that kick off. It is an inconvenience. I'm wondering if crew. Despite them saying they never would, will they now give some more tickets to Wrexham fans because they've fallen off? It looks like they're playoff bound, or at least clinging off, or clinging into the playoffs. Will there will there be a full house? Has been the case with everywhere else so far, or will they consider giving Wrexham another five hundred because we know that they still are the hottest ticket in town? So there may be the possibility. Mm. Well, anyway, let's talk about those last four games because that victory um, against. Colchester has really changed things from where we all thought we were heading. Um, it's made our lives a lot easier, and it's meant that it's very possible that we could even be promoted this time next week, next weekend. I don't think it's going to happen, but it is very possible. So those last four games, let's run through them. We've got two, we've got three home games, one away, um, and we've got Crawley on Tuesday night, Forest Green next week, then Crew away, and then Stockport at home, for which I'm praying... Uh, won't be uh, any kind of uh, decider on promotion. Um, title decider, I wouldn't mind, but not not so much for promotion. Uh, Andy, I mean, what what do we need? Do you know? It's isn't it? It's seven points, does it? I think, doesn't it? Or was it seven points? points? Yeah, seven points uh, mm. takes it. Doesn't matter what other people do. Mm. Um, I think, I think if we get, I always thought that we needed uh, three wins from our last five games. We've got one of them. Um, I think yeah. another two will get us through because you just can't see um, MK Dons and, and Mansfield winning everything. So well, they play they play each other, don't they? As well, yeah. So, take yeah. yeah. so they could get a point there, but you know, I, I think seven points makes it absolutely doesn't matter what anyone else does. But um, I think six points will do it in in the end. Um, mm. So. Two home, two home games, and you know we fought against Harrogate and and Tranmere. This is a chance that we can really pull away, and it didn't happen. So, mm. you know, and a note of caution as well in that that result yesterday for um, Crawley, by the way, which seem which seems to have come out of nowhere. But they beat Mansfield four one at Mansfield. If that's not a, a warning shot across the bows for for Tuesday night, I don't know what is. Tim, it's not going to be an easy one, is it? They got they got the third best home record in the league behind Mansfield and Stockport, so they're no mugs. They're absolutely no mugs. Um, we're fifth, believe it or not, um, fifth for away away form. Um, but yeah, I, it, 
they're, they're doing well. You know, they're doing well. They they are creeping. They're in that playoff picture big time. They got a very savvy manager there, who knows what he's doing. He seems to be getting a tune out of them. I think they're preseason favourites to kind of be right at the bottom end. So to be where they are is is, is astounding, really. Yeah, you don't you don't go to Mansfield and knock four in if you're not a good team. It's as simple as that. You know, we've played Mansfield three times this year. We've had to grit it out. We've had to grit those those results out. You know, the draw and, and the two wins. So, yeah, uh, again, we keep saying which Wrexham's going to turn up. Um, we need we need those kind of like seventy to ninety minute performances back. Really do. You can't just go on a wing in a prayer and play for play well for half an hour or whatever and hope to get something from it or at least make it more comfortable. So it's going to be tough, but that place is going to be bouncing on Tuesday. It's going to be bouncing because people are, people can taste it now. It's not far away. And I'd love it. I'd love it. I'd, I, it not just not just for us as fans and the area and, and, and everything else and the owners and the documentary, but for the players because it's a lot of pressure. You know, it's a lot of pressure. That's put on them with the cameras there. You know, people can can level things at them. You're picking up a good wage. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. But they have performed. They, they performed. It's second in our first season back in the league. You know, they deserve. They deserve it. They deserve it. Mm. And I just hope that they start just playing with a little bit more gusto at home, just to make it comfortable for everybody, <laughs> rather than just being squeaky yeah. bum time every week. But you know, they've got they've got the mentality. We saw that yesterday. They've mm. got it. So it's just about having it all the time. And Andy, I mean, I remember thinking last week. You know, when we had these uh, six games to go, I was thinking oh, the, the away games look tough, right? You play in Doncaster form team, and you play in the team that are fighting for their lives. And I thought, you know what? I take two points from those two, and I'd win the two home games. So getting three, I feel like we're a bit ahead. I don't mind that. Um, how are you feeling about these home games? Do you think? Do you think we can do it, or do you think actually there's another twist in the tail here? We might we might drop a couple of points on Tuesday night and make next Saturday a bit more interesting. I, I think any any team in the top uh, five can drop points. I think it really is topsy turvy. I, mm. I just feel it's in, it, it, it's in our nostrils now. Uh, I think it's what Tim is saying. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> just made me laugh. It's in our nostrils. But you know, I mean, the scent is there. I mean, and and I think I think the the fans know it, and I think the players know it as well. And I think they really will go out because I don't think there's a huge amount of ex. Of, well, yeah, of course, there's expectation, but to be honest, I, I feel that we're over. Oh God, touch wood. I hope this is wood. It's from IKEA. Uh, but uh, I think. I just feel that we're over the hump a little bit. We're in the final stretch. I think they can mm. see it in front of them now. There are big game players there. The likes of James McLean has been brought in exactly for this part. We know what Mullin, what that Mullin enjoys stuff like this. You know, if th- there's people like O'Connell who who have tasted this before, um, yeah. I, I think I, I really do think I think we'll get four points from the next two games, but I think others will drop. Yeah. Will drop points, and I think it will be done hopefully by crew. I mean, Mansfield MK Dons next Saturday is huge, isn't it? Because I mean, if if Mansfield beat MK Dons, then it makes that equation so much easier for us to finish yeah. third. Essentially, like yeah. it, it, it's it's huge. We're um, all Mansfield. <laughs> <laughs> we're all Mansfield now on Saturday. Um, what about um, and, and one thing I think is worth mentioning as well, without again touch touch wood, and I don't want to give them the kiss of death, but have. After we lost to Grimsby in the playoffs um, at home, have we lost a massive game in the league? Like, to, we, we have become quite a big game team in terms of at the, the, the end of the season, those big games, we win. Is that fair? I can't think of a single one that we've really lost. Um, yeah. Um, Stockport. Um, well, Notts County is the big one, isn't it? Notts County. We, we, yeah, we beat Notts County back end of last season. But um, I, th- I think, yeah, I, mean, I see what you're saying there. But if, if you look at that, the side that played Grimsley in that game to the side we've got now, it's chalk and cheese. It's mm. maybe maybe a hand, maybe two or three players that are in that that starting eleven maximum. I think so. I, I just mm. think it, it takes a bit of time to to get yourself into a place where you can go. You know what? If people, I mean, Trammy, they did a number on us with with that that breakaway goal and then defended. You know, so it's it, that was one yeah. of those things. I just think now that it's just looking good, isn't it? It's looking good for 
for, for so many reasons. And, you know, then let's get over the line and then they'll be, let's get, let's, let's get behind them because I'm telling you now, and we all know get it. Him. Stop singing you know, songs. About I'm gone. The reason, the reason you're not getting in a conquest song today, because Mullin might send his heavies round to, to beat some <laughs> stuff. <you know. laughs> um, joking, obviously. Um, I j- just think about this moment for a second, right? These are probably the last four chances you're going to get to see some of these players play for Exxon. That's the fact. I think mm. we're going to see a clear out in the summer. I think we probably need one if we're going to give a good account of ourselves in League One. So, you know, think on the, the some of these players aren't going to be around, you know, after after this month for Wrexham. They've given their all. There's not many players that we can say under, under this ownership that have left and we can say they were rubbish. They've given something. Some have given a lot more than others, but they've all given something to the cause. So when we go out there the next two games, give them, give them your all because, like I said, some of these players won't be won't be here for us next season. So let's back them and see, see what happens. Yeah. Back the boys, make some noise. You heard it here first. Um, well, he probably didn't, but thank you everyone for listening. Again, um, we look forward to joining you next week. Where who knows what we'll be discussing. We'll either be incredibly stressed or incredibly happy. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, thanks for listening and speak to you next week. See you. Bob. Cheers. Bye-bye.